Welcome everyone. I'll begin by handing over to Dr. Bloomfield for a health update and then I'll share a few updates from the government this morning. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, today we're reporting no new cases of COVID-19. This means New Zealand's confirmed and probable COVID-19 total cases remains at 1,497 and of these 1,147 are confirmed. We now have 1,398 people who are reported as having recovered from COVID-19. This is an increase of 12 on yesterday and 93% of our cases are now considered recovered. Today there are just two people receiving hospital level care in Middlemore and North Shore hospitals and neither is in ICU. There are also no additional deaths to report today and we still have the 16 significant clusters, four of which are now closed and a number of which have not had any cases uh, between 14 and 28 days. So they are on their way to being closed off as well. Yesterday, our laboratories processed 2,893 tests, bringing the total number of tests completed to date to 197,084. And I actually was on a, a Zoom call earlier on today with one of our primary health organisations and a number of GPs uh, down in the southern uh, DHB area. Uh, to thank them for the work they have been doing. Uh, that particular area, they've taken over uh, 10,000 swabs and the effort that goes into for each uh, clinical person to dress up in PPE, to do the swab, to ensure the paperwork is done properly, to get it to the lab and then the lab staff as well. So every one of those nearly 200,000 swabs, which have been a pillar of our efforts and to uh, support us going into Alert Level 2, has been work on a number, by a number of people, and I just want to again acknowledge that work. Uh, in terms of hospital visits under Alert Level 2, two uh, an update on that, and obviously our highest priority as we go into Alert Level 2 is to continue to protect visitors, patients and staff, while of course enabling those very important human interactions that are so essential, especially when someone is unwell. Uh, on the ground, visits are managed by district health boards and there will be flexibility on the part of individual clinicians and or um, managers of services. But the general principle will be in our high risk areas, which include ED, intensive care and maternity, it will be uh, one visitor still and one visit per day. While in other parts of the hospital, still one visitor at a time, uh, but uh, more than one person is able to visit during the day. Uh, as I say, there will be flexibility on the part of hospital staff uh, in response to individual circumstances as well. Uh, I do encourage people to just check also with the hospital around visiting hours because obviously those visitors, visits will need to occur during the usual visiting hours. And be mindful when you go of those core public health principles of di uh, distancing by two metres, uh, hand hygiene, and of course do not visit if you are unwell. Uh, in terms of the Section 70 order, I've just issued an updated uh, or I'm issuing an updated and amended order which will be available later today on uh, the Ministry of Health's website. And this order specifically allows people to enter businesses to prepare for the move to Alert Level 2 on Thursday. And finally, today is International Day of the Nurse and in 2020 it is part of an international year of the nurse and an international year of the midwife as well. So we are celebrating our nurses now more than ever. It's very clear that having a good, strong, well-trained uh, nursing workforce improves health outcomes for individuals, our whānau and communities. And every day, nurses have played a critical role as part of our COVID response uh, over the last few months, in addition to the work they do routinely providing fantastic care for New Zealanders. And I'm sure all of New Zealand will join me in thanking our nurses today and indeed every day. Kia kaha, kia maia, kia mana wanui. Thank you, Prime Minister. Kia ora, Ashley. Uh, can I just um, reiterate the comments made by Dr Bloomfield about our nurses? And uh, I have to say, even before COVID-19, I received quite a few letters um, where people who have been through our public health system 
really want to acknowledge the workforce within our system. And I often will get a message saying uh, how kind, how professional, um, how uh, supportive uh, our nursing workforce and our clinical workforce are within our public health system. I don't often get a chance to pass on that feedback, but today seems like the day to do it. Can I also acknowledge that we have a huge nursing workforce trained in New Zealand, working abroad, and who are doing the hard yards through this pandemic as well. And we want to acknowledge all of the Jennies uh, all around the world. Earlier today, um, the government announced the biggest ever increase in funding for district health boards, as well as additional funding to support DHBs to deliver more services, uh, more surgeries, more procedures, radiology scans and specialist appointments to help clear the COVID-19 backlog. We are investing over $4 billion more into our health system because the lesson from COVID is that we need to be prepared and that a strong health response is the best way to protect jobs and, of course, ultimately um, be in a position to get our economy moving again as well. We never know when the next virus um, or health emergency is going to come. But when it arrives, we know that it pays to have a world-class health system in place to deal with it. In fact, that is a commitment we should be making all the time to New Zealanders. When uh, we were elected, we did inherit a health system that did have a number of long-term challenges, not the least of which was some years of underfunding and public health had experienced that acutely, but also issues with infrastructure and facilities. Over our two previous budgets, we've made a number of investments in health and health capital. Uh, and as part of rebuilding together, our budget steps that investment up even further. Alongside our announcement of increased funding for Pharmac on Sunday, it is clear that our rebuilding together budget will also ensure that our health system is resourced to get us through and offer even more care and support to New Zealanders. The strength of our health response means also that we're able to get to level two and move our economy uh, into a phase where it's opening up again even quicker. Central to this is helping our small businesses get up uh, and on their feet uh, and supporting them as they look to operate from Thursday for many. To assist with their recovery, the first tax refunds in our $3 billion tax package have been paid, with cash flowing into the hands of businesses. To date, 676 businesses have applied for refunds and payments worth more than $62 million. This package, announced last month, is the largest support package to business via the tax system in modern history. Today, I can also confirm that the Small Business Cash Flow Loan Scheme is officially open. In just a couple of weeks, IRD officials built a new system to process applications for loans that will be interest-free if repaid in the first year. These will be a source of working capital for businesses, helping with things like fixed costs like rent. The scheme went live last night and is able to receive applications from today. Payments will be made within five days of a loan being approved. So whether you're a sole trader wanting to borrow, for instance, up to uh, $11,800 uh, $11, interest-free, or you employ 50 FT staff and want to borrow up to 100,000 interest-free, go online to the Inland Revenue site and uh, you'll find all the details there. And finally, our wage subsidy scheme has now paid out 10.7 billion to 1.75 million New Zealanders. That ultimately uh, is what it has taken to make sure that we keep those people employed um, to their place of work and so they can be at the ready uh, when their businesses uh, open back up. Finally, on public transport, with more people returning to work under Level 2, I do just want to make a bit of um, comment on public transport and people getting to and from work. Uh, you remember when we talked about the Alert Level 2 framework, I really encouraged employees to have conversations with their employers around whether or not they'll continue working from home or whether they'll be coming into their place of work. And I really want to encourage those conversations to be had, um, to discuss whether or not there are options around flexible starting and flexible finishing times to perhaps space out necessary commutes. I imagine some workforces will be looking to lock in the productivity gains uh, that were made while people were working from home, and that's one way that they can do that. I know there's some good guidance that will be issued, but in summary, um, plan your trip, keep your distance, and that will be required on public transport, and of course, track your journey as well. 
And as always, if you are sick, um, stay at home. I would encourage patients across the board though, particularly in those first few days of level two, as we have with every level, uh, it will probably take a period of adjustment, particularly as people work out the best time to travel on routes that allow distancing. Finally, I've seen a bit of commentary overnight and this morning from businesses and people about how they're preparing for the next stage of life. And I'd sum up what I've seen basically with Kiwi businesses uh, and Kiwis just getting on with it. Kadrona Ski Field, for an example, is getting ready for skiers to hit the slopes in late June and working with the government on standards to set up zones around areas where groups may come together, like near chairlifts, planning for a domestic market and ensuring that they've got really strong contact tracing in place. A Wellington hairdresser is doubly pleased she can reopen on Thursday and has made it this far without needing to make any of her team redundant because of the wage subsidy. Others have written to me about catching up with their wider families, conscious about those small gatherings and keeping it small. And I have to say that's something I'm looking forward to as well. All right, we're ready to take questions. Yeah. Under, about, level two, um, how do you, under level two, how do you justify allowing 100 people to go to the movies but not to a funeral? Again, the whole definition is whether or not you're coming together to be with others. Um, and there are circumstances where people just aren't in the same space in order to mix and mingle. Uh, and that's the, that's the risky behaviour. Look back again on the areas where New Zealand has had trouble with COVID. It's been weddings, it's been bars, it's been social gatherings. And so that's where we've put the limits in place socially distance at funerals as well and they've waited until level two some of yeah. the bodies and morgues waiting until level two to be able to properly mourn and grieve and all the indications you gave last week were that they'd be able to do that and then yesterday saying it's going to be capped at 10 do you recognize how much of a blow that is to those grieving families? i have always said through all of this that the thing that i have found as a human the hardest in all of this has been funerals in tangihana um, i've known people who have lost very close family members. And I can't imagine trying to grieve um, through a global pandemic for a loved one without being able to be together with others. But the one thing I also know is that funerals in Tangi are a place where you want to comfort people. It is your natural instinct. That's why we come together. And the idea that we would force people to not be able to comfort one another, to support one another, is equally a very, very hard thing to comprehend decision for themselves. Equally, we're doing the same for every area where these are natural life events. We've made the same hard call for weddings, funerals, any gathering of note. You know, I spoke to someone last week who turned 100 and had no gathering. The, this is across the board. We know this is causing pain, but we equally have tried to be really consistent, not um, see a situation where people really question why they can't come together and others can't. But this has been very hard is now saying that you could have a wake after a funeral in a hall with 100 people as long as they're properly socially distanced. Your cabinet doesn't even understand the rules. No, you've heard me, you've heard me clearly outline them. Um, the, this is only intended, we hope, to be a very, very short period that we're asking New Zealanders um, to unfortunately stay with us on what is a very difficult thing to do. But the intention is it will get us there faster to when people can come together again. Again, this is all based on the advice of health. And you can imagine I feel a real obligation to make sure that, I, uh, that we're listening to that advice. So perhaps this is something I can also ask the Director General to comment on. Well, thank you, Prime Minister. Again, we look very carefully at the sorts of activities that were higher risk as we go into Alert Level 2 with the intention of making sure we are keeping people safe, we are uh, maintaining the gains we have made, and with a clear um, expectation and obligation on us to provide additional advice to government in two weeks' time about increasing the numbers up, and that's what is expected and intended. Mm. Did, you oh, consider, did you consider making an exemption for yeah, we did think it. We did think about whether or not there was a way to do things differently. Um, and again, as, as I look around, I think we can see that actually everyone struggled with this globally. But probably what people have otherwise also seen is that there have been outbreaks as a result of funerals around the world too. Um, but yes, we did think about it, and it was just a very, very difficult thing to find a way where you'd have carved out exemptions um, for specific areas that are very similar to other kinds of gathering, gatherings. And ultimately, we want to protect people. What about church services? Not, yeah. not necessarily funerals um, or, or weddings. Churches are saying that they, they, they are you know, willing to enact social distancing, um, and you can go to a movie with 50 people, but you can't go to a church. 
church services. And we, and we did have good discussion around that as well. You know, ultimately, some of the feedback that we had um, from those even within church community was that, uh, that actually it is a place for fellowship, it is a place for community to come together. And if we were building rules that said ultimately we were trying to stop people on large scales interacting with one another closely, then that is where that fell into that same category. If you think about it very simply, about whether or not you're going into a place where you know other people and are likely to congregate with them, that's really where that line falls. And that's why we've evenly uh, we've used evenly across the board the rule of 10. In general suggested that it was a case uh, for religious gatherings even under level three. Because Sorry, what was that? In general suggested there was a case for religious gatherings under level three because um, there's a restriction on religious freedom kind of war yeah. issue here. Now we're going to level two and there's still this restriction. Are you, are you worried about that? No, no, because as you'll find, it also equally they're weighing up the, the issue of, of health against um, that as well. Uh, what I would say is, you know, this is um, something that I personally... Um, you know, gave good, strong consideration to, you know, it's this is in my background as well. I, I was brought up in a, a family that practised its faith um, uh, religiously, and so I did think about this a lot, and it's something that has weighed on my mind. Um, but equally, there in Australia, you see similar guidelines and rules in other parts of the world, all for the same reason, because it's all based on evidence. Yep. Field, how many of the comp compassionate cases to visit the dying have now been approved? Uh, now I'm sorry I haven't got that information with me, but I will um, we'll, we'll provide that on our website later later on, or we can get it to you later. Uh, would you describe contact tracing or our capacity now as gold standard? Yes, I would, and I think the latest data, and we're getting more each week uh, from our public health units, uh, and so we're aggregating that over the last two or three weeks, suggests that the key uh, indicator, which is that identifying and isolating close contacts within 48 hours, at least 80% of them, we are achieving that. And furthermore, we are continuing to increase our capacity out in our public health units to be able to do more and more. Currently at 185 cases per day, and we are um, targeting the number of 500 over the next six weeks. Sam. Prime Minister, you, you said yesterday that you were comfortable with the support being provided to migrants in New Zealand who had been affected by COVID-19. Uh, how, how does that tally with the news that a, a family of seven was given a handful of tins of, of uh, beans and spaghetti, a few other small goods, and told them that they were meant to make that last for about two weeks of lockdown? Um, I, I am comfortable with the support being provided. Where that, prov that support is being provided is as we would expect, and that, is, that does not meet my expectations. Um, 27 million was put into making sure that those services on the ground who knew where the need was had the flexibility to provide both food and support for accommodation to house people if they needed that as well. Um, whilst I, I can't comment on the specifics, I do understand that locally the team is trying to get in touch with the family in question because what they've had reported to them doesn't meet their expectations either. We heard from another woman, uh, mm -hmm. another migrant, a pregnant woman, who when she asked uh, the local civil defence uh, group for help was told, we can get a food parcel to you in five working days and that will be all you get, a one-off because of the demand. Uh, again, you know, not, not talking about the particulars, but in principle, wouldn't it make more sense to deliver direct cash support like a benefit as we do for other New Zealanders in difficult situations? Yeah, and, and again, that doesn't meet my expectations either. Um, as you have heard me just say, we did support directly on the ground with uh, over um, over $20 million provided on top of what already was available to those community organisations to beef up what they were able to do as quickly as possible. So not only did we have local civil defence playing that role at a local level, um, and they delivered thousands and thousands of food parcels and support, um, we also of course had NGOs, we also uh, uh, had Fano Order playing an incredible role delivering um, packs to families as well. So we were really looking to mobilise those support networks that could get food out the fastest or other forms of support. And we gave them the flexibility to do that as well. Why aren't you treating these stranded migrants, people, in the same way that you're, that you're treating other people in need who happen to be residents? What's yeah. the difference? Um, well, of course, there's a difference um, uh, through our uh, work and income legal framework, just quite simply how they're treated when it comes to our benefit system. And that is the reason why someone, when they have a visa into New Zealand or are applying for one, 
are required to demonstrate that they have the ability to provide themselves with a level of support should they ever need it. Now, of course, these circumstances are extraordinary and we wouldn't expect um, that necessarily to hold for a long period where someone is deprived of work or in the situation we've seen with lockdown, which is why we look to provide local support that wasn't just food but had the flexibility for accommodation and any other essential needs that group may have had. Yeah. Um, as we've seen, as, as you'd be well aware in other countries, the easing of restrictions has resulted in flare-ups. What are you both most concerned about at level two? What will be kicking you off at night? Yeah, and flare-ups are a concern. Second waves are a concern. And you see, you know, I start my day reading the international news and we've seen coverage, um, obviously, of, of Germany. In the past, we've seen the coverage in Singapore. More recent days, a bit of discussion, uh, perhaps to a lesser degree, but around um, uh, patterns in South Korea. Of course, we worry about that. And that's why we're making sure that we prioritise trying to get people back into work get their incomes flowing again, but also that we manage the risk. And that has meant some hard decisions, but hopefully ones that are balanced and look after as many Kiwis as possible. Um, yeah, just to tourism, um, yeah. the tourist leaders who spoke at the committee this morning were saying they need clarity on the wage subsidy. Now they yep. can't wait till Thursday. What assurances can you give them that help is on the way? Oh, you will have heard me say yesterday very clearly there will be additional support for business, um, uh, particularly affected by the ongoing alert framework um, and who are struggling to operate at full strength under a COVID environment. Uh, and so I've also pointed to the budget, um, but to tourism specifically, I'd say not only did a survey from the tourism industry suggest that over 80% um, were accessing the wage subsidy already, we also have looked at specific redeployment support to get their workforce into other opportunities. Uh, and you will see a tourism sector package uh, delivered from this government as well. The concern <laughs> was in terms of, of um, the language you used talking about our borders, saying that our borders would be closed for some time yet, has, has scared off a lot of people from booking uh, flights and things like that for next year. Do you, can you offer any other um, assurance, I guess, to those people of when they may be able to start getting people from overseas? Yeah, I mean, of course, um, I want New Zealanders to be able to move freely as soon as we can safely do that, and I want... Uh, those from overseas to be able to be in a position to safely come and experience New Zealand's hospitality again. Um, but what we're having to prioritise at the moment is the ability of people domestically within New Zealand um, to um, work, play and experience New Zealand as freely as they can. Um, and that does mean for now having to keep restrictions at our border. The trade-off would have been lift border restrictions and us all live with restrictions in our day-to-day -day lives. I acknowledge that as a trade-off, but what I hope we can do for tourism is get domestic tourism moving and also be in a position as soon as we're able to at least get the Australian market moving too. Yeah. Um, do you regret not letting um, stores, uh, DIY stores uh, like Bunnings stay open for the wider public during lockdown now that they're closing stores, people will be wanting that sort of material? Uh, well, of course, um, at level three, um, I saw that the likes of Bunning were opening click and collect shop options. Many of them, of course, have um, trade windows where they're able to, uh, where they were able to operate in that way. So um, that was something that they were able to adapt to. Of course, online purchasing as well was able to open up at that level too. Hi, it's the Sport, Sporting Z CEO um, on MediaWorks on AM Show today have said um, that the gathering limit of 10 people would apply to contact sports, but the press conference yesterday seemed to imply that it would. Was he mistaken? Yeah, so. Uh, happy, contact sports allowed to yeah, happy to clarify that. So, um, professional and semi professional is sorted and will be resuming. Um, more broadly, on just sport generally, what we're looking to do is actually just give certainty generally on the date um, that it's likely that those community codes are wanting to restart. And I understand we should probably be able to do that um, later today, and that will help people with, with planning more generally. If they night someone wants to go and play a rugby game between nine other people, that's fine. Uh, again, actually, some of those community codes have indicated to us that they're not ready to open up again. So I do want to make sure, and please, if you'll stick with me here, I would like to let the Minister for Sport give that clarity this afternoon around what dates those codes will be opening up. Going back to Tangi Hanga, yeah. um, 
is it possible for multiple groups to pay their respects as long as there's only 10 people there at any given time? Yeah, so if, if we have 10 people sticking with 10 groups of 10, then that would be within the room, uh, within the rules. What we don't want is them all then to come together at a conclusion. So a large wake or a large gathering afterwards. But yes, if you have, um, uh, if you do have someone who is who is lying um, at Marae and people are coming in in groups, uh, then yes, that is something that could be managed and would be within the guidelines that have been set. Do you, do you agree with, just your thoughts on, on the hungi, because um, Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters had some interesting comments today when speaking about it. He said that cultures need to adapt or die. Do you think it can be sustained in a post-COVID world? Oh, I, do you know, my view is that I have seen um, iwi leaders actually determine for themselves how they are going to keep their people safe um, and what um, they wish to do with cultural practice in this environment. And I have, um, uh, I give complete support to that and have complete faith in that process. Um, China's repudiated New Zealand overnight for supporting Taiwan's observer membership for the WHO. So I guess, do, I mean, do, do you consider these warnings like a diplomatic going through of the motions or is an actual threat to the bilateral relationship as China claims? I'll just take this as an opportunity to reiterate the position uh, that I did again this morning, uh, and particularly New Zealand's relationship um, through a number of years, we've always um, taken a one China policy, uh, and that is uh, continues to be the case. Um, what I think what we're referring to here is really our ability to learn um, from places during COVID-19 and thereafter and their health responses. In the same way that actually the world learned a lot from China's response their use of a lockdown in Wuhan demonstrated the ability to control the spread of the virus in a way that probably saved a large number of lives. Uh, equally, a place like Taiwan has uh, used some uh, particular approaches um, that have demonstrated also success in their management. And so really for us, it's about being able to gather that knowledge, but it fundamentally does not change our policy with regards to One China. Deputy Prime Minister last week to tell oh, the... Without being called, Jackson. Um, was it appropriate for Winston Peters last week to tell the Chinese ambassador to listen to her master? To, to sorry? Listen to her master. Uh, I would like to see the quote in full before being drawn on comment on that. Do you know? Back on the wage subsidy, have mm. you waited too long to give a signal of its successor to businesses because they've now got four weeks left and a lot of them are having to give four week redundancy notice periods? Uh, again, this runs through till beginning June. It was a 12-week payment, and it's only, of course, running out on the 9th of June for those who took it at the very, very beginning. We actually had a large number who took it much later in that 12-week period, and so we're receiving the subsidy for, for longer than just that beginning. Uh, uh, also, of course, it does help that we have that certainty now for businesses around where we are in the alert framework and their ability to operate again as well, which also was something they were looking for for certainty. Those ones that would have taken it in the beginning of it is, is tourism businesses, and they are screaming out for some kind of certainty. They yeah. said they needed it last week, not the budget And this we've week. given a, a clear signal of our intention there, but also the fact that there will be um, sector-specific support um, for, for tourism and other areas we know have experienced a big um, hit. But what we also need to do is work alongside tourism as they rebuild for those specific sectors. Domestic, uh, we will continue to work on Trans-Tasman and then a longer-term plan around our re-entry into a global market. Will one of those sector-specific packages be hospitality? Sorry? Will one of those sector-specific packages be hospitality? Uh, again, of course, we're setting out a path where hopefully hospitality can get back up and running. Some of those more generic frameworks for support, like the wage subsidy, have been um, important to that sector. Um, but when you think about those that were first to close, actually they are ones who have relied on crowds and audiences, so the likes of um, the arts, obviously the media, aviation, and you've already seen some support specifically rolled out there. Yeah. Um, given we don't know the outcome yet of the review into the COVID-19 outbreak at Waitaki Hospital, was this a cluster waiting to happen as been reported by one media outlet today? Well, I think they're separate. I would comment on the latter. I don't think it was a cluster waiting to happen. The cluster happened around the age residential care facility. And um, part of the care of the residents, because they couldn't staff the facility, was to bring them into Waitakere Hospital. I did speak with the acting chief executive of Waitamata DHB yesterday, and I'm expecting to see the draft report later today. And I know their plan is to make that public 
this week. And as I said yesterday, the important thing here is we, we learn from each of the instances we have had so that we, we can then update our approach and, and policies, which is uh, nation, nationally, which is what we're intending to do here. Can you explain why St Margaret's rest home residents weren't immediately taken to North Shore Hospital? Uh, yes, because the, um, uh, the level of care it was felt they required was appropriate for Waitakere, it was also closer to their whānau in their community. Mm. Benedict, um, Benedict. Yeah. sorry, I'll come back to you, Tony. Yeah. Um, the Electoral Commission this morning, they announced a whole range of measures to try and keep the public safe when it comes to uh, voting on Election Day, um, physical distancing, PPE yeah. for um, electoral staff. Mm. Have you given any thought to how you know, this will affect your campaign? Actually, only really, if I'm honest, only in passing. Uh, uh, you can imagine why the election feels, uh, in terms of days, weeks and months, a lifetime away, as probably you'd imagine in the middle of global pandemic. It's not the thing that I have yet turned my mind to. Uh, what I am hopeful of is that we will be in a position uh, to even have a greater degree of interaction with one another um, then than we are now. And I think that's what we're all working towards. But to be honest, I haven't put my mind to it. Prime Minister, was Winston, was, was Winston Peters I'll incorrect come back today to after that. when he said that uh, after a tangi, groups of Mormon teen could gather in a, in a hall or they could, they could book an individual bookings at restaurants to, to gather? And it was always quite confusing if, if Mr Peters himself is... Sorry, did you just ask that of me or Dr Bloomfield? Of me. As, as I've already, already clarified, the, the rules around group bookings is, again, that consistency. Um, if you are coming together for any social gathering, any social gathering, it's groups of 10. And we do have to apply that consistency. It would be totally unfair uh, to have any kind of wiggle room when we are asking so much of those particularly who wish to grieve in larger groups uh, to give any leniency for any other group in that regard. Yeah, to Toba. Um, sorry, do you want Why do you think what's the Peter's got it wrong? Oh, again, I wasn't here for the stand-up. I, I don't want to make any assumptions about what he did or, or didn't say on those guidelines. Trevor? The Health Ministry said there were there are two people in hospital with COVID-19. However, we know for a fact that at 1.30pm yesterday, there were five confirmed COVID patients in North Shore Hospital alone. Are you being deliberately misleading to try and make the data look better? Oh, uh, definitely not. Uh, in fact, we've uh, been very open with the, the, the data to date. And in fact... Um, one of the things, like for example, we've included all our probable cases in our overall total, which many countries don't do, and we've been very inclusive in terms of our deaths, um, even when there were negative swabs and there was some potential uncertainty around the cause of death, we've gone with the clinician's view. Um, the, the issue here is, and it was the same uh, down in Canterbury for the Rosewood Rest Home, is where people have been put into a hospital setting but uh, um, are not there because they need hospital level care, but purely because of staffing issues within the facility, then we haven't counted them in our numbers of people requiring hospital level care. That the health ministry then needs to change the way it words or categorises COVID patients in hospital for the, the benefit of the public. Uh, but if we were to say that we had five people then in hospital care, that assumes that they require that level of care and perhaps may lead to those assumptions around whether or not someone's their health status. Most people, if they hear hospital care, will make an assumption about their health status um, around COVID rather mm. than just whether or not they need to be in a particular facility for care. Clarify then in total Sorry. how many patients are actually in hospital in total around the country, regardless of whether they were put in hospital due to staff issues at the previous place of care? Oh, we can absolutely do that. And what I would also point out is that um, St Margaret's and many um, age residential care facilities have hospital level care mm -hmm. as one of the, um, the areas that they do. So they do provide a high level of care, but they're not, these people are not in hospital. So it's a, a similar uh, thing there, but we're happy to make that mm -hmm. um, clear on the website. Yeah. The total number of hospitalisations in the entire course of the, sorry. Of oh, the total hospitalisations. I'll let Dr Bloomfield find, find that number. Let me we... just find the number here. So the total number of hospitalisations to date is, uh, actually I've got percentages, so that's, uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, 92, 92 cases. That's a remarkable number compared to the rest of the Is that the best one you've got to sort of sell New Zealand's response, do you think? Well, uh, as a so as a proportion of our total number of cases, it is um, perhaps lower than many other countries. Uh, likewise, uh, we've had very few people requiring intensive care unit um, level of care. Uh, and likewise, our number of deaths is uh, is very uh, small, less than 2% proportionately, and you'll see many other countries 
that have uh, a, a higher percentage of their total case numbers or a higher proportion that are deaths. I think what it reflects is the extensiveness of our testing. So we've got a high level of confidence. We have picked up a very high proportion of the actual cases we have had even through uh, the lockdown period. Just the last couple of questions. Prime Minister, you said yesterday that she wouldn't comment on the NZVME stuff situation because of commercial sensitivities. Is that because the government itself might be commercially interested in buying stuff? Uh, that is a, a huge assumption. Prime Minister, Minister, what, what, what just a question from a must colleague. Be a long one, then. Uh, <laughs> just a question from, from a colleague. Uh, Australian radio host Alan Jones has resigned due to ill health. He made some um, comments last year about you. What is your reaction to, to that news? Oh, when everyone, in, anyone uh, has ill health, I wish them the very best. Prime Minister, Sky, yes. Sky City have said um, that anyone entering their casino need to be part of their rewards program. Their, their take on that is that they need to be able to contact trace people. But are you concerned that that would encourage gambling of people if everyone's required to go onto the mm. special reward program? I wouldn't mind actually, if you wouldn't mind. I, I wouldn't mind taking a little, a little look at that because you know, one of the reasons, of course, that we are asking businesses to do that are for legitimate health um, reasons, um, if people are in close contact with one another in particular. Um, but equally, there might there may be an overlay here specific to gambling. So I might just go and take a closer look at that. You will have heard us talk in the past about using technological solutions um, that would actually give uh, our customers a bit more control. So you can use things like QR technology, which means that someone might just scan um, uh, before going into a, a premise, and then they're the ones holding that data. So if they become COVID uh, positive with COVID, uh, then actually it's through them that we access that information rather than the other way around. So um, that's why those kinds of solutions are important alternatives. Oh, last right. last question, Gina. Uh, um, follow on that, what progress has been made on that National Contact Tracing Act? What's the time frame? Yeah, and so that's just to give you an indication, of course, we've always said that we think that there are a range of solutions there and we've never wanted to be too fixated on just one. Uh, again, one of the things I'm observing in Australia is, again, uptake, but also whether or not it's providing or meeting expectation. We, however, in the meantime, continue to work on those solutions, but they will include alternatives, not just um, Bluetooth apps that talk to each other. Yeah, so that's one of the options that we have been looking at is just an app that uses QR t um, code technology, which is common um, for, for many existing services. Yeah, thanks everyone.